At this time, congregation, we'll have the reading of uh, the Word of God. If you'll turn in your Bibles to the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews. And you'll uh, right away see the uh, connection between this chapter and what I read out of Exodus chapter 24. Hebrews chapter 9. Let us once again hear the word of God as it's read, starting at verse 11. Verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For with the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. And may God the Holy Spirit see fit to instruct us and teach us from his word here in Hebrews chapter 9. Excuse me. The title of the message today is The Mediator Sprinkles Us with the Blood of a Better Covenant. And since that's not in the bulletin, that's not fully spelled out, let me say it a second time. The Mediator Sprinkles Us with the Blood of a Better Covenant. Now, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is like a prism of many colors. And these colors should be a feast to your eyes. Here's some of the radiant hues. Propitiation, redemption, atonement, ransom, reconciliation. Somebody once said that God does not grade us on the curve, that is on the basis of our performance, but he grades us on the basis of the cross the performance of Jesus Christ. Propitiation, as uh, I'm sure many of you know, means that God removes wrath from us because sin is tre treason against the most high majesty of God. But Christ becomes a trophy of God's wrath so that he satisfies God's divine justice. Reconciliation by Christ's death unites us with the God from whom we're separated from birth. And redemption is a purchase. Christ buys you by his blood. Redemption is Christ's payment or his, or his ransom. In other words, you're bought by the blood of God. So when the Lord Jesus Christ propitiated his father, God's wrath was removed. And when he reconciled you, 
your alienation was removed. And when Christ redeems you, slavery to a cruel master, Satan, was also removed. You're not your own. You're not your own because you're bought with a price. Now, these are just some of the hues that are beamed by God's colorful kaleidoscope. But there's another glorious hue that we must also focus in upon, and that is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is also covenantal. Unhappily, each one of those teachings I just mentioned has been weakened or depleted or destroyed altogether of their rich meaning. For example, some believe that at Calvary, Christ only canceled our sins. But Christ's death on the cross, you see, was not a mere cancellation. It was a propitiation. God's wrath against us is turned away, and it was meted out upon Christ, our substitute. So, as R.C. Sproul likes to say, it may sound, used to say, the late R.C. Sproul used to say, it may sound like a paradox, but we are saved from wrath by wrath. And reconciliation doesn't mean that you reconcile yourself to God as if you're the engineer of your own reconciliation. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And redemption doesn't mean that Christ paid a ransom to the devil as if he made a deal with the devil so that Christ exchanged himself for you becoming the property or the slave of the devil. Rather, Christ's ransom money was not paid to the devil, but it was paid to the justice of God. Now, when we come to the covenant, we also find some misunderstanding. Some are not very clear about the covenant. They're unable to relate the covenant to Christ's death. Yet each time communion is celebrated, the words of Christ are repeated. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. From 1 Corinthians 11. So what do those words mean to you? This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And why do the scriptures teach that Christ's death was covenantal? That his blood was type C, I like to say, type C, in that it was covenantal. Well, the answer comes to us from the book of Hebrews. Let's explore the context of this book before we go any further. Some Jewish Christians were being serenaded to renounce the Messiah and to, to be wooed back into the slop of decadent Judaism. The uh, late uh, Presbyterian minister Donald Barnhouse once expressed the context of the book of Hebrews this way. He said, the epistle to the Hebrews was written to the Hebrews so that the Hebrews might cease to be Hebrews. These Hebrew Christians, you see, were overtured by the enemies of the cross to renounce Christ. Satan's bait was a perpetual holiday from persecution. The candy was that if they renounced Christ and returned to Judaism, they would no longer be deer meat for the Jewish hounds of God who were hunting the Christians everywhere. So God, the Holy Spirit, warns these hunted Christians that, that they, they must not cave in. They must not listen to these people. And the grand reason for it, stated by the Holy Spirit here, is because you have been blessed with a better covenant. That word better, as you probably know, is a very key adjective in the book of Hebrews, used, very, used often. And particularly, the new covenant is better than the old, especially better than the shedding of the blood of bulls and goats and calves, who were uh, all shadows of uh, better things to come. For us, there's better promises, a better country, heaven itself. Better, a better covenant. Everything is better. The Messiah is better, a better mediator than even Moses. So Hebrews chapter 9 trumpets Christ as the mediator 
of a better covenant. And of course, as the mediator, he is a go-between of two parties who are at loggerheads or at war with one another. His job is to bring these two opposing forces together to destroy the alienation and to meld them together into one. In fact, our, old, our English word atonement and archaic meaning of that word, we don't use it that way, this way anymore, but literally means at the very beginning, at one moment, at one moment, or to make two one. Now let's zero in upon the covenant and the cross for, uh, for a moment. First of all, the cross of the covenant requires a bloody death. This word blood is used frequently in the New Testament, some 98 times. And most of the time when the word blood is used, it's describing a violent death. Twelve, tri twelve times it describes the blood of sacrificial animals. And other times, it describes the precious blood of Christ. For example, Ephesians chapter 1, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. And in Colossians 1.20, Paul speaks of the blood of his cross, linking blood to Christ's death. So please keep all of that before your eyes today. The mathematics or the algebra of your redemption is that blood equals death. Blood does not have to equal excessive bloodletting or excessive bleeding. In fact, uh, Dr. Leon Morris in his book on the atonement on page 63 of that volume, maybe it's there, maybe it's in your own library or in the library here, he wrote this. Crucifixion, like stoning, was a form of execution on which little blood was shed. So there, there cannot be any emphasis on blood as such. It is simply a way of referring to death, he wrote. You see, when a person was crucified, if you were crucified, you wouldn't bleed to death. You would die of exhaustion. Certainly crucifixion wasn't, was not a picnic in the park, <clears throat> and certainly Jesus did bleed, but he didn't give up the ghost as if he had lost every pint of blood. In fact, he died, remember, the Roman soldier threw the spear, and out came water from his side and blood after his death. Now this is uh, very significant because it discourages what I call uh, grisly fascinations of the, of the ghoulish who uh, major in the macabre. For example, when I, uh, many, uh, many years ago, I visited, uh, on a mission trip, I visited uh, Me uh, Mexico City. And I was given a tour of some of the cathedrals of the Roman Catholic Church by a Presbyterian minister down there. And uh, he told me that in, 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 in Mexico that the, uh, focus of the Roman Catholics is upon what he called the four B's of Jesus. The four B's. Well, I'd never heard the, about the four B's, and so I asked what he meant. And he said that the people there are obsessed with the four B's, and then he spelled them out. Jesus beaten, Jesus the baby, Jesus buried, and Jesus bleeding. Now, as you know, uh, from your uh, un uh, un uh, understanding of church history, sometimes in the Roman Catholic Church, a picture of a bleeding Jesus is even conveyed uh, in, the, in the Catholic art anyway. It was claimed that a, a painting literally oozes blood. They refer to that as a miracle sometimes when it does happen. See, that's an example of having a fascination of the grisly. It's also interesting that some Protestants have been bewitched by the same error, such as uh, some of the early Moravians of the 18th century as represented by Hal Harris, who um, was a good man, but he had fell into that error. And still others in our own time actually claim that the actual 
blood of Christ is now in heaven. In fact, it's said that by some in the Protestant church today that the cross was not complete until Jesus went up to heaven and took his blood with him in heaven. John MacArthur is accused, falsely uh, accused of believing this. Well, this is all based on a misunderstanding of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, which is mistakenly interpreted, but here's the verse, Hebrews 9, 12, not with the blood of, of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all. Notice there it says, with his own blood, he entered the most holy place. So they argue that Jesus took his blood all the way up to heaven and that your redemption was not complete until that happened. Well, the preposition here, with, with his own blood, simply means by means of his blood, he entered heaven for us. Not that his blood was cargo that he took up to heaven, that it was right by means of his blood, by means of his death, that he entered into heaven. Now, when the Bible declares that Christ shed his blood, it signifies his suffering and death. This is what I just said. Even in the garden, he sweated great drops of blood. He suffered there for you. People that are people fascinated or mesmerized by physical blood will often diminish the full theological meaning of Calvary because uh, they're sidetracked by the, by, what's, by the grizzly. Now, it is true that Jesus was murdered. It is true that the Savior was scourged. It is true that a crown of thorns was plunged into his scalp and that he bled. It is, it's, it's true that crucifixion does involve bloodletting. In fact, this is celebrated by that famous hymn by Charles Wesley, Arise My Soul. Arise my soul, arise, shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Five bleeding wounds he bare, received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayer. They strongly plead for me. The fifth wound being the spear thrust of the Roman soldier. The, the overall limelight of the scripture, of the scriptures, falls upon death. Blood equals death. Jesus was targeted by the wrath of God when he went to the cross. So literal blood shouldn't be magnified too much. It speaks primarily of his death and of his suffering for you. And the fact that Christ's death occurred only six hours after he was crucified, the normal time was about one to three days, and that his actual bleeding was even less than the two thieves proves the point. So when the New Testament accentuates blood, your attention uh, uh, should be riveted to his death and its meaning and his suffering. Many years an old uh, preacher said something like this to his congregation. And he would repeat it over and over again. Make much of the blood, I say. Make much of the blood. His meaning was make much of the blood of Christ dying for sinners. And that should be your testimony and your song as well in your life. Make much of the blood. I say to you today, make much of the blood. That's the thrust of Paul's entire theology and his preaching. He said, for I am determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, this takes me to uh, my second major heading today. Christ's death was a covenantal death. You are not only saved by Christ, you are saved by the blood of the covenant. Now, the cross is thoroughly covenantal. This is affirmed in both the Old and the New Testaments. In fact, there's an old saying. It's not repeated very much anymore, but it's still an old saying, and that is, Open the Bible anywhere, and it bleeds. The Westminster Confession of Faith speaks about the consent of all the parts of the Bible, which not only underscore all the parts that, all the Bible that glorify God, 
but, but testify also of our need, of your need and mine, of blood atonement. I like to say the Bible bleeds from the book of Genesis all the way through the book of maps. C.H. Spurgeon once said, with every text of the Bible, make a beeline toward the cross. That's the way the Bible should be read. And this is clearly affirmed here in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 19 through 20. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has enjoined to you. Now notice there, after Moses spoke every precept of God's law, which included the Ten Commandments, he took the blood and he sprinkled all of the people. That means that the people were baptized, sprinkled by blood. There's a heavy emphasis upon sprinkling in the book of Hebrews. In fact, the sprinkling is even called baptism. In the Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10, the writer there speaks about multiple or divers washings, which is the Greek word there, washings, is the Greek word for baptism. So not only was baptism by sprinkling, but all the, people, uh, the covenant people were baptized as well, including the children, because they were the Old Testament church. Thus, ritual baptism was an Old Testament ordinance. And, ex and this explains why when John the Baptist appeared on the scene bapt baptizing, there was no objection. It was like the most natural thing in the world. John, here's John coming out of the wilderness. He's baptizing. Baptism wasn't a completely new ordinance that John introduced to the people of Israel. You see, the Jews rightly connected baptism with cleansing from sin. Yet isn't it interesting that even the imagery of cleansing can be easily lost in baptism? Many years ago, the late uh, Presbyterian minister John Gerstner visited a church that had adopted some very unusual practices. And one, one such practice was to present a white rose whenever a child was baptized. Well, Gerstner was curious, and he asked about the meaning of the white rose. And the elder of the church said, the white rose represents the innocence of the child. Well, Gerstner looked him in the eye and he said, I see, but tell me now, what then does the water symbolize? See, in that congregation, they had completely lost sight of the fact that the water of baptism represents cleansing from sin. There's another example that I think is more scriptural. A man uh, years ago was converted and uh, was baptized in a local river. After he was baptized, he was asked to share his thoughts about his baptism. And you know what he said? He said, may God have mercy upon the fish. He knew what the water of baptism symbolized. Compare that with our own president's reluctance to own up to his own sins saying that he couldn't remember ever a time in his life when he had asked for forgiveness. Now, in the Old Testament, literal blood was applied to just two individuals. When a priest was consecrated to his high priestly office and when lepers were cleansed, a ram was killed, and upon Aaron and his sons, the blood was smeared on the lobe of the, the right ears, the thumb of, the, of their right hand, and the big toe of their right feet. What is that supposed to indicate to us? Well, it means very simply, of course, that they were cleansed from cellar to dome, from top to bottom. And the fact that the book itself, the scroll, was cleansed shows that whatever our hands touch, we pollute. 
In other words, the Mosaic Covenant symbolically cleansed the people. But in the New Testament, Jesus actually cleanses the people, his people, you and me. Now, his covenant death on the cross isn't to be confused with a testamentary death. This is a huge point, a colossal point that I'm going to make now. You'll notice that the words in Hebrews 9, the words testament and covenant are employed, and this has caused some confusion. You may think, for example, that a testament is identical to a covenant and vice versa. Well, are they the same? Well, there are certain similarities. Some ways yes and some ways no. But let me say also that the Greek that's translated covenant here in one verse is the same, is the same Greek that's translated testament in another. So if you're looking for the Greek to clarify, that's not going to happen. What you have to do is look at the context. Now, what do these two English words, covenant and testament, then, have in common? And then we're going to look at what they don't have in common. But what do they have in common? The first is that a testament and a covenant are both sovereignly administered. A man's last will and testament is sovereignly determined by himself. He alone identifies his heirs and apportions the family heirlooms as he alone pleases to do. And you know that if you, have a, you yourself have a, a last will and a, a testament. Your decision to apportion the, those things is 100% sovereign. A testament isn't a compact or a mutual agreement or a list of suggestions or a parity covenant among equals. A testament is sovereignly determined by the testator. And so the writer illustrates a covenant death with a testamentary death in that way. Dr. John Murray explains the Roman idea of a testament, which Paul speaks about here, or the writer speaks about here. If it was Paul, I don't know. This use of the testamentary provision of Roman law to illustrate the inviolable security accruing from the sacrificial death of Christ serves to underline the unilateral character of the new covenant. One thing is apparent, he writes, that a testament is a unilateral disposition of possession or of property. Now, the same is true of a covenant, except that a biblical covenant was established differently. A biblical covenant is God's pledging himself to us, his covenant people, in blood. It's a historical bond or pledge by God in blood. It's a sovereign commitment of God in human history. And this commitment is sealed by blood. Now, to give you the idea, when God made a covenant with Abraham, he commanded him to dice and to slice the, some animals and to lay them across from one another. And then, in a, in a dream, the Lord passed between the, the slaughtered or dismembered animals in the form of a smoking torch. What was God doing here? What was God telling us here? That he commits himself to his people in blood. The Lord was cutting a covenant, assuring us that, he, that if he didn't perform, if he didn't come through, if he ever fudged on his promise, then the dismemberment that befell the animals would also befall him. So if you cut a covenant, there's blood. You've butchered the animals. And also a second continuity between a testament and a covenant is that a testament proclaims the death of the testator. The writer here talks about this. He says, for a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it, have no, it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. Now, when God cut a covenant, he exposed himself to dismemberment if he did not perform what he promised to do. And when a testament is made, 
it anticipates the demise of the testator. So what a testament and a covenant have in common, those two things. But there's also some major, major, major differences between a covenant and a testament. It would be quite wrong for us to say that a covenant is the same as a testament. It isn't. All right, what are some of the differences then? In a covenant, and we're only going to look at two, in a covenant, God, death stands at the very beginning of the relationship. The covenant maker calls death upon himself if he were to fudge or to renege upon his promise. Well, that's not true of a testament. But in a covenant, the covenant maker dismembers the animals and the birds at the outset. The animals are sacrificed, in other words, so death doesn't wait for three score years and ten to occur. But in a testament, death comes at the very end, and it results in the inheritance. That's one of the differences. And most importantly, most importantly, in a covenant, the death of the covenant maker is substitutionary. In a testament, substitution is completely absent. In a covenant, you have substitutionary curse bearing, which is what Jesus did when he went to the cross. In a testament, the testator dies in his own place. But in a covenant, the covenant maker atones for someone else, you. So in verses 15 and 16, God provides an illustration. He's not telling us that a covenant and a testament are exactly the same. The thrust is that in a testament, you receive an inheritance after the testator dies. Now, sometimes it's asked, why does the writer then confuse us by bringing in the notion of a testament here? Why does he say things that makes it sound like a testament and a covenant are exactly the same? Well, the best answer to that question pertains to the phrase in verse 15 of the eternal inheritance. The thought of an inheritance, you see, is best illustrated by the death of a testator, even though Jesus was not a testator. But we do receive an inheritance. And that's the reason why the illustration of a covenant is brought to our attention. So here's what I mean. Christ has cut a covenant for you. He, he passes between the animal parts and uh, pro uh, promises you salvation. He promises you redemption to secure your redemption. He becomes not only the priest, but he also becomes the victim. He's committed himself to you, lock, stock, and barrel. He's the cutter of the covenant, and he is also the one who is cut off for you. As Isaiah chapter 53 informs us, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. So God promises to save you. He passes between the dismembered animals, so to speak, with the intent to save you. He makes the covenant, and then he bears the wrath. Now, who would have ever dreamt that the Son of God himself would pass between the parts bearing God's wrath upon himself? But Jesus did. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's but one way to be saved, the shedding of blood, covenant blood. That was true both in the old, for the Old Testament people and it is also true of, for us as well. As verse 15 says, and for this cause he is a mediator of the new covenant that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So here we learn that the mediator of the new covenant applies his work to the sinful hearts of the saints in the Old Testament 
and he applies his work to the sinful hearts of his saints to us in the new. And both they and, and us are redeemed by Christ's covenant blood by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the cross of the covenant is for you, as I said, God's covenant people. When you anchor the covenant to the cross and the cross to the covenant, then you'll understand, first of all, who Jesus died for. Who did Jesus die for? He died for his covenant people. This means that Christ didn't spill any of his blood in the sense of wasting his blood. He shed his blood. If he spilled it, then it would be wasted. But he shed his blood for his covenant people. This means that his work on the cross was 1,000% successful. As the Christmas message go, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now this covenant blood encourages you to come to God. You'll have confidence to prostrate yourself before the throne of grace. But if you wrench or minimize the covenant from the blood, your assurance will, of salvation will become very rocky, uh, will totter, will be very iffy. If there's no covenant, then you're left with a lot of frightening uncertainties. We call it jokingly in reform circles, the daisy. The daisy, you know, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Somebody that says that doesn't have very much assurance of his salvation whatsoever. There would only be a trickle of comfort for us. But if you anchor the blood to the covenant, then you're assured that your sins have been forgiven, are forgiven, and will be forgiven. God's covenant makes present and future forgiveness a cast iron fact. You see, you're not forgiven by caprice or by whim. God, your God is not moody. He is not fickle. He's not, as the Puritans like to say, as variable as a weathercock. No. Your God saves you with covenant blood and therefore uh, comfort, lots of comfort, should flood your heart and soul. John Calvin even wrote that God makes himself our debtor by, by promising things to us. He makes himself our debtor, including, of course, a forgiveness <clears throat> by this covenant blood. <clears throat> Dear saint of God, you are forgiven on the basis of the shedding of covenant blood. So you have no ground, therefore, to be unstable in your profession of faith, unstable like water. The Holy Spirit never taught a man that his sins were too black and too dark to be, or too many, or, or too repetitive to be forgiven. You can go to God not just on the basis of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, but knowing also that his blood is covenant blood, a guarantee of your forgiveness. Now this cross of the new, uh, uh, of the new covenant, <clears throat> new covenant is, is much better than the old. We all know that in the Old Testament these were nothing but types and shadows of the ceremonial law. The old covenant, you see, <clears throat> could not plunge uh, into the, uh, the depths of the sewer of our hearts and cleanse us from sin. I like to call it the Mariana Straits of the human heart. You see, the new covenant cleanses our guilt-laden consciences. This is what the writer says here. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Your conscience the guilt of your conscience is thoroughly washed, removed, thrust into the heart of the sea, and remembered no more. That's what David prayed for, didn't he, in Psalm 51? Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, 
and cleanse me from my sin. Now, unbelievers don't have that kind of assurance. In Shakespeare's Macbeth, you remember the murderess famously walks in her sleep in the castle with a garment in her hands, and she says to the garment that's blood-stained, out damned spot, she says. She complained about the imaginary spot of blood in the garment that was racking her conscience and could not remove that spot. In fact, Macbeth himself lamented that even the ocean itself couldn't wash his, his hands of Duncan's blood. Now, we could bring Lady Macbeth up to date, I suppose. During the recent presidential election, one of the candidates erased thousands of emails that she received after receiving a congressional subpoena. She used a software device called BleachBit. By using BleachBit, she no doubt thought that any incriminating evidence would be lost forever. It would be chucked down the memory hole. But did she really succeed in that? Well, maybe from the local gendarmes, the police force, but not any more than Lady Macbeth. The emails may be erased, but the sin-infested and polluted conscience remains. Christ is in the business of making us whiter than snow. His business is to make you really clean, truly clean. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Set, wrote John in 1 John chapter 1. So you're cleansed by covenant blood. The new covenant is better than the old. Let's remember, Jesus Christ does not wish away your sins. You do not wish away your sins. But rather, Jesus Christ washes away your sins. God wants you to make much of the blood much of the blood. Now, I think here some of you are, are thinking something here, something like this. If Christ's blood washes me thoroughly, then why don't I feel forgiven? Why am I still racked by a guilty conscience when I look at my life? Well, here's one answer to that, an important answer. The answer is very simple. You are not looking at Jesus closely enough or long enough. If you were as obsessed with Jesus as you were obsessed with your own sins, your conscience would be at peace. Now, I know this is a struggle in the Christian life. Nobody can live up to this perfectly. But I do believe that if we look 10,000 times at our sins and only one time at Jesus Christ, we are going to be miserable sinners all the time. You see, Jesus is extraordinarily qualified to be your mediator. That is, to be the go-between between you and God. And he is no anemic mediator who tries his best to bring about reconciliation or forgiveness. He always succeeds. His being God and man makes him preeminently qualified to be your mediator. And as God, he brings God to man. And as man, he brings man to God. Jesus is Jacob's ladder who connects heaven and the earth, a go-between. He's that kind of a mediator. And he does this by sprinkling covenant blood on our guilty consciences, saving us from dead works to serve him the living God. And so I end with a quotation from Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon said, For every one time that you look at your sins, look 10,000 times at the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will have confidence and joy and assurance of your salvation. Do not wrench the covenant from the blood or the blood from the covenant. Amen. Let us.